take a form loss just to remind us and our procedure. Thank you. Um, OK, so you remember what did we do last time? We had the uh, geometric side, or OK, so last time we did the, the Peterson trace formula and the Kuznetsov trace formula. And just to refresh your memory, what did the, uh, the geometric sides of these formulas look like? So in the Peterson formula, we had a sum over Klusterman sums. against uh, a J Bessel function with a real integral, odd integral parameter here of four pi root mn over C. And then in the Kuznetsov formula, we had a similar sum of Klusterman sums and then with now some, um, some integral transform of J Bessel functions, but within a purely imaginary parameter. Um, so here there was some there was some test function h of t over cosh pi t d t. And I made a remark at the end of the lecture last time that what we'd really want is not this Bessel function or this integral transform of h but an arbitrary function here so that we can control exactly the range of summation over the modulus of this Klusterman sum. So neither of these formulas alone is sufficient to do that. And in fact, you can actually, um, we can actually check uh, using some special, some, some integral formulas that um, this difference of two J Bessel functions that purely uh, imaginary arguments is actually orthogonal to all of these real argument Bessel functions um, in L2 of R plus. Oop, dx over x. So neither of these is going to suffice to give you any arbitrary function here. Um, but in fact, it turns out that having both these test functions and these Bessel functions gives you everything, okay? And that's going to be the final formula. So now I'll give you the statement. Um, so this is what's actually going to be useful for doing sums of Klusterman sums. So I'm gonna let my test function be f. So I'm gonna let uh, f be say twice continuously differentiable on the positive real line um, such that say f of zero, 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 and this uh, function f is, is, is non-oscillatory. So it satisfies uh, say the eighth derivative of f has some bound like, uh, like this where alpha is bigger than two plus some small number delta, and this holds for A is uh, zero, one, and two. So this kind of just says that this test function decays at zero and uh, is not oscillating too wildly. Um, okay, and then let me write down the integral transforms that end up coming out. So of, co of course, to okay, so here's some integral transforms, so MF T is going to be pi i over sinh pi t integral zero to infinity of the imaginary part Bessel functions and then similarly I'll have an integral transform for the for the, the real argument Bessel functions. So I'm gonna have a, it's a gamma, say four, k minus one factorial over, okay, so there's some normalization, but it's mostly integration against the, this Bessel function. Okay, 
Okay, and then uh, just to remind you of the notation, so this set of uj's is going to be a complete orthonormal set for the, the cuspidal subspace. Gamma is going to be uh, gamma naught of Q. Um, and so I'll write rho j of n, the Fourier coefficients, of uj, and I'll write tau frac a n uh, t, to also the Fourier coefficients of the Eisenstein series at the cusp a. Um, so z half plus i t. And then also write a f of n for the Fourier coefficients of a, um, oh, I shouldn't reuse f, right? f was a test function. So uh, uh, what's a good letter for, oh, g. Okay. g was going to be in this orthonormal basis of holomorphic forms of weight k uh, for gamma naught of q with trivial central character. Okay, and then the formula will come on the next board. Um, so I guess I'll attribute it to Brueggemann, Kuznetsov, but I think um, it's important also to say, I think the generalization to gamma naught of Q is done by Dejue and Ivanovich. And they, uh, I think, really pushed the arithmetic applications of this formula um, with the arbitrary test function on the, on the geometric side. So, so here it is, okay, so you have the similar sum over C, which are zero mod Q, of these Klusterman sums. And now with an arbitrary function F of this class. Okay, so <clears throat> of course we haven't tried to optimize exactly for which test functions this holds, but this at least gives you a pretty wide range of test functions. Okay, and then this is just going to be equal to a sum of all of these different types of terms weighted by these different, uh, these different integral terms. So, so here's a sum over MOS forms, M, uh, M, F, TJ, rho J, M, n <coughs> plus sum over the, the cusps of gamma naught q and then integral over the continuous part And the holomorphic part. So here is k at least two uh, and even weights. And then this is the n transform. And f of k. And then I have a sum over the g in my orthonormal basis. Okay, so that's the formula with the test function inverted. I think it's also important to say maybe a couple of the remarks. Uh, so here, oh, I should add the hypothesis that m times n is positive. So the remark is that we can also do uh, 
m times n is negative with different integral transforms. There's a similar formula, but actually in the m times m negative case, the, the holomorphic contribution doesn't show up at all because, of course, holomorphic forms have no negative Fourier coefficients. So it's a different... So maybe that's a remark. One remark, two, is that um, kind of been uh, not talking about the dependence on different cusps here explicitly, but the above formula, this formula is, uh, we used the Poincaré series defined at the cusp infinity to prove the formula, and then also we took Fourier expansions also at the cusp infinity. So um, the this formula, the above, formula is um, uh, let's say um, it's like the infinity finney formula is um, using Poincaré series at infinity and uh, Fourier expansions at infinity, but we could also, the same arguments work, and there's also formulas for uh, other choices of cusps other than just infinity and infinity here, and you get other interesting formulas, um, which are very useful for applications, but I kind of don't have time to write them all down, so maybe I'll come back to that later. I don't, where, where, where's the k Bessel function? Uh huh. Um, well, I'm not sure that's actually the k Bessel function. Um, Yeah, that's definitely true. In the opposite sign case, you would get a K-Bessel function here. I, the, that, that would be the different uh, test function I alluded to. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we just saw in the proof of the formula that when you wrote down that, that Fourier expansion, um, the the analytic part of it was just a different formula because I used a different kernel in the Poincaré series, and because I picked a kernel in the Poincaré series that was an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator, we got these J, J Bessel functions instead of the the real valued ones. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could also see it as a reflection of the, the Fourier expansions just have completely different right. shapes too, which just comes from solutions of those differential equations. Okay, so that's sort of the final formula. Now I want to actually get to some applications of this. So um, I think Kloostermania is about the interactions between number theory, sort of applications of number theory to automorphic forms, and then the applications of knowing things about morphic forms giving us number theory results through this 
this, um, this Kuznetsov formula where I have a lot of freedom with this test function here. So I think it would be nice to give one sort of application in this direction and one application in this direction. Um, and maybe the easiest thing to start with is, it is giving some information about automorphic forms coming from um, something about Klusterman sums. So, uh, so let's see, if I write um, u0, u1, u2, etc. These are uh, MOS forms. So these are these the same u0, u1, u2 here. Um, and I've ordered them in terms of their eigenvalues. So here, I'll take u0 to be the, the constant function. So And that will have eigenvalue lambda 0 equals 0. And maybe I'll write the each of the eigenvalues by either, uh, so I'll say delta uj is lambda j uj. And you'll remember from last time I had a, a three different notations for writing down these eigenvalues. So sometimes I write sj 1 minus sj for this number, or sometimes we'll write 1 quarter plus tj squared. And then the S and the T are just kind of, they're related by SJ is um, one half plus I TJ. And so we know in general that these lambda J are always going to be positive real numbers. Um, so maybe in terms of the T, so lambda J positive, implies that this tj kind of, it lies in the following set in the complex plane. So here's the, the real axis, and then it could also be an imaginary number, a purely imaginary number between i over 2 and minus i over 2. Okay, so those are the possible spectral parameters for these, these u0, u1, dot, 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 dot. So there's the famous conjecture of Selberg uh, that we call the Selberg eigenvalue conjecture. Which is that, uh, maybe I'll say, I'll make it in terms of lambda one, which is the first non-zero eigenvalue. So the conjecture is that lambda one is at least one quarter. So maybe put in other terms, it says that the, the real part of the SJ spectral parameters are all one half, uh, or that uh, this TJ is actually a real number. Uh, okay, so and here, I mean, uh, as we vary through the congruent subgroup, so as uh, gamma naught Q varies. It's maybe important to just note that the, um, the smallest eigenvalue MOS form for the example of we can actually compute this in explicitly for small congruent subgroups. So for example, for SL2Z, the lambda one, I think if I remember correctly, it's, it's, it's about 91 point something, which is very much, much larger than one quarter. And so we, these can be computed explicitly for small examples and they tend to be well above uh, one quarter, but sort of the smallest eigenvalue tends to get approach one quarter as you go to uh, very large queues, and the conjecture is it always stays above one quarter. And so you can see there's sort of a, a nice analogy here with some other complex numbers that you, you've, you've heard of that have real part equal to one half. Um, so you can actually frame this conjecture in terms of zeta functions also in what's known as the, the Selberg zeta function or, or h mod gamma naught of q, but that's kind of the subject of a, of a different lecture, so I won't go more into that. 
Um, okay, so I think the, what's the, the record towards this conjecture? So uh, uh, world record. is by uh, Kim and Sarnak, um, who showed that lambda 1 is at least 975 over 4096. So it's getting pretty close to one quarter, but we're still not there yet. Um, so just as an application of this Kuznetsov formula, I'm going to sketch Selberg's kind of first result towards this conjecture. So, so Selberg, long before this, uh, showed that this first eigenvalue was at least 3 over 16. Um, and you can use this Kuznetsov formula to, to prove that. So here's the, the proof in brief. Um, OK, so we have this nice formula. We're actually going to even take uh, m is equal to n. So these products of Fourier coefficients on the right-hand side of the formula all become absolute value squares. And we have to pick a test function. So I'm going to pick, um, so I'm going to let, let's say phi be the, the function defined by the following picture. It's the fixed C infinity function that's just a bump between one and two. And then I'm going to let the test function f of x be v of y times x. And let's say y um, starts at like 10 and becomes very large. So uh, doing this translation, I'm going to move this bump function to being picking out a, a very narrow interval close to zero. Okay. Um, so if I use this test function, this is kind of the first test function I think you would try in applying this Kuznetsov formula. Uh, so what do you get on the left-hand side? So on the left-hand side, we'll have a sum over C is 0 mod Q of S, M, N, C over C, V of 4 pi y n over c. So here, if I just apply the ve bound for these Klusterman sums, what do I get? So this is bounded by the c, which are 0 mod q. Maybe c goes up to 8 pi n y of the GCD of n and c to the half c to the half on the bottom, and maybe the divisor function of c. OK, so this is just a standard sum of multiplicative functions. We can evaluate. Maybe I'll throw the q dependence into the less than less than, because we don't really uh, care about it for the current proof. So this ends up being about square root in size. OK, so the left-hand side, or the geometric side of this uh, Kuznetsov trace formula, ends up being about size y to the half log y if, if I pick this sort of test function. OK, and then what about the other sides? OK, so there's some integral transforms that we have to, to battle with a little bit here. Um, and I don't want to do too many computations at the board, and they're not all that difficult once you have kind of a few uh, few integral formulas for the J Bessel function. So I can actually, so let's see. Um, let me write phi tilde of S is the, uh, the Mellon transform of this function phi, x to the S to the S. Over x. So then, if I just use um, kind of a formula for the Mellon transform of the J Bessel function, I find m phi of blank y 
of t. This is bounded by uh, the Mellon transform at 2it plus the Mellon transform minus 2it over e to the pi t. So this is, in particular, it's uniformly in y. And then we can also show, uh, again, just using standard estimates on Bessel functions that you can look up in a book of special functions. Like for this one, it's just its Taylor expansion at zero. Um, you can show that this is less than less than one over four pi y to the k. So it's even better. It's very rapidly decaying in terms of y. So here, um, uh, I guess I forgot to say this is only for t uh, a real number. So here, um, t. Okay, so brushing the actual computations on the rug, I'll ask you to trust me that you can work out these bounds on the, the Mellon transform, or not the Mellon transform, sorry, these uh, Bessel transforms. Um, you can actually show that all the other pieces here on the, the spectral side, or the right-hand side, just converge to constants as y goes to infinity. So. Uh, so the whole side converges to a constant. So maybe O n q of one as y goes to infinity. Um, except for the possible exceptional eigenvalues. So I'll say if uh, uj is such that uh, tj is not real. So what we actually end up getting is that so sum over uj exceptional of uh, m of tj, absolute value of rho j m squared is less than less than y to the half log y throwing all the n and q dependence into the, into the constant. OK, so then. turns out that we can actually prove a, a lower bound for this test function in the purely imaginary direction. And then we can conclude something about what these possible eigenvalues are. Um, OK, so this m t dot y of t, this was this integral. And um, OK, so let me suppose now that tj, uh, maybe itj is real, and that, in fact, OK, so there's, there's like these two, I can have a, a positive or negative purely imaginary number. So let me just suppose that itj uh, is actually positive, but of course the same thing works for the negative half. And so between these two functions, this one is actually going to dominate if I restrict these to be positive imaginary numbers. And so what is this, uh, this j minus 2it of x? Actually, as, as x uh, goes to 0, ends up 
being asymptotic to just from the, the Taylor expansion at, at zero um, to one over some gamma function, but most importantly, uh, x over two, so minus two i t. So this actually shows that this m transform of t uh, okay, is asymptotic to, maybe I'll write um, c for some constant which I'm not gonna make explicit, but y to the two i t. Uh, and this is as y goes to infinity. But now this, I assume to do something positive. So I can actually get a lower bound on this. And okay, what do I just conclude? Uh, okay. So this implies that the sum over the exceptional uh, possible exceptional MOS forms here of y to the 2it rho j n squared bounded by y to the half log y. So then if I take y going to infinity, here, because I know, because I'm assuming there are exceptional eigenvalues, I have to have at least one non-vanishing Fourier coefficient. And so then running y to infinity and remembering that kind of non, -in weirdly 2it is actually a, a real number. Uh, this just implies that it is less than or equal to one quarter. So that implies that uh, the smallest exceptional eigenvalue has to be at least Three sixteenths. So that's kind of how you show the first non-trivial progress towards this Selberg eigenvalue conjecture. I think, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I guess that was just the appendix to the paper, and he was also involved in this. Thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, so if we look at the, the proof a little bit, we, what do we do? We really just here use the Weil bound for the Klusterman sums, and the rest of it was just some sort of follow your nose integral transforms. So the proof actually kind of shows something maybe uh, a little bit more. So actually, if I assume um, that I have a stronger estimate on this sum of Klusterman sums than what the Weil bound gives me. So let, let, me, let me, as an assumption, assume S, M, N, C over C, and then maybe here's some other smooth function. So I'll say C is uh, in C infinity R plus non-oscillatory. Non C of C over Y, let's say. Let me assume for C zero to Q that I can give an upper bound for this maybe where the constants depend on M and N, but that is the, of the strength Y to the theta plus epsilon. And if I plug that sort of bound for sums of Klusterman sums into this argument, this is actually going to show exactly what it shows that the, um, the imaginary part of the T1, the smallest possible eigenvalue, uh, is bounded by theta over two. So i.e. lambda one is at least one quarter minus theta squared over four. So you see in one direction from exactly this argument that bounds on sums of Klusterman sums tells you something immediately about the smallest possible eigenvalue. And uh, okay, the argument also will run in reverse. So 
let's see if I um, so also same argument will imply that this sum of Fusterman sums is actually bounded by uh, x to the square root of max 0 and 1 minus 4 lambda 1 plus epsilon minus x, where lambda 1 is the smallest eigenvalue. So this kind of just using the most obvious test function in the Kuznetsov formula really shows that these are exactly the same problem getting cancellation beyond what's just given by the Weil bound, or, or okay, give, getting any cancellation in sums of Klusterman sums of this kind is exactly equivalent to the problem of the of Selberg eigenvalue conjecture. So I think that's one of the main um, important features of, of this Kuznetsov formula is it shows that these are really two equivalent problems. So. Okay, the next thing I want to do is uh, give more of an arithmetic application. So this is um, maybe the one of the, I just have time to kind of sketch one of the main kind of most impressive arithmetic applications of this Kuznetsov trace formula. And this kind of is about, um, goes back to work of Fouvry and Ivaniet, uh, Fouvry, and then Bombieri, uh, Friedlander, Ivanich, <coughs> So I have to give a couple quick definitions. So we say uh, an arithmetic function lambda from n to c uh, is of level d. If lambda d is zero for all d bigger than d, and lambda d, I guess an absolute value is bounded by the d, maybe I'll say level d and uh, exponent k is bounded by the k di divisor function. Oh, but now I have an annoying problem where I've used d. Uh, Okay, maybe I'll say tau is the is the is the kth divisor function. Okay, and then we'll also say that um, lambda is well factorable if um, for all factorizations of uh, of d into d1, d2, uh, there exist uh, arithmetic functions, call them mu and nu, of, uh, of levels d1 and d2, such that lambda is mu Dirichlet convolved nu. Okay, so then the theorem so I'm going to let A not zero, epsilon positive, X at least two, um, and then uh, A positive. So then for any well factorable function lambda uh, of level q uh, is going to be x to the 4 7th minus epsilon. We have the 
this sort of level of distribution of result. Q Maybe I'll say uh, P is uh, A mod Q, P less than or equal to X. So this is. This is a really big result, so I'm sure uh, most people in the audience can are familiar with these sorts of uh, okay results that are shaped like the bombieri vinogradov theorem. So of course, the, the important point here is that this 4 sevenths is strictly bigger than 1 half. So this is sort of giving some result that sort of goes beyond the Riemann hypothesis on average. Um, and I should mention that uh, each of these three papers get the same result, but with a, a different exponent here. And the, uh, the Bombieri, Friedlander, Ivanich paper gets this exponent 4 sevenths, which is the best exponent. Um, and Fouvry and Ivanich and Fouvry came earlier, and their papers are kind of sh shorter and get smaller exponents. But all of these exponents are strictly bigger than, uh, strictly bigger than the 1 half barrier. So. Yeah, so the constant depends on, maybe I'll, I'll write that on the next line here. The constant depends on many things, definitely on the residue class, but also on the, um, the exponent of the well-factorable function, and on A, and on epsilon. So. Uh, So that's, of course, very important in applications. And we'd really love to have that it was uniform in A, but yeah. we don't have that. Absolutely, yeah. So this is sad. <laughs> we would really, really like for this to be uniform. Uh, we would especially like. But we don't have it. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, I would really love to also to put an absolute value in place of this parentheses. But in particular, I cannot take this function to be the sign of the thing in, in, in the middle. So it sort of has a few defects, but it still pretty impressive that you can get beyond a half at all, so. Um, it's like divisor functions, or? Um, so, 